Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Sally Budget. Our top stories this hour. Getting relations back on track, Chinese Premier Li Chung kicks off his first visit to Australia. G7 leaders back calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as they wrap up their summit in Italy. Cyril Ramaphosa is re-elected as South Africa's president after an historic deal to form a unity government. And how climate change has created a surf tourism industry in the not-so-Arctic Ocean. China is willing to work with Australia to keep bilateral relations stable and mature. Chinese Premier Li Chung delivered this message on his arrival in Adelaide for a four-day official visit to Australia. He's the first Chinese Premier to visit Australia in seven years. CGTN's Greg Navarro reports. The South Australian city of Adelaide is the first stop of a four-day visit here in Australia for Chinese Premier Li Chung. The events that will be held here in this state include a trip to the zoo on Sunday with a focus on two giant pandas. Those pandas are on loan from China and the lease is set to expire later this year. Now, while the pair has been hugely popular with the public, their stay here has had much broader implications on the relationship between the two countries, which is being referred to here as panda diplomacy. The premier is expected to make an announcement on the future of those rare animals that could include extending the lease for the two currently here, or since the pandas have failed to breed during their time in Australia, they could be replaced by two new pandas. The trip to South Australia is also meant to highlight the easing of restrictions China placed on several Australian export items in 2020. Those were seen in response to Australia's former government calling for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19. Now that includes wine, which was devastated by more than 200% tariffs those along with most of the trade restrictions were lifted earlier this year. South Australia is home to most of the country's wine production and the Premier will visit one of the wineries in this state on Sunday. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Adelaide. G7 leaders have used the final statement of their summit to support a U.S. brokered deal for a ceasefire in Gaza. The world leaders also pledged a $50 billion loan to Ukraine using frozen Russian assets. Charles Gibson sent this report from the Italian city of Bari, where the summit was held. On the final day of this G7 summit, the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney, had a bilateral meeting with her Canadian counterpart, Justin Trudeau, with his country taking over the presidency of the G7 in 2025. Now, there will be other lower-level ministerial meetings over the course of the rest of the year, but really the acid test for any G7 presidency is that leaders' summit that we've just had here in southern Italy. At a press conference, the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney, said that the technical details still need to be finalised for a $50 billion loan that's being issued to Ukraine using the profits from frozen Russian assets in the West the aim of the G7 is to get that money to the Ukrainians by the end of this year. We also saw Georgia Maloney saying that the G7 is not about the West against the rest of the world. And of course, on day two, we did see uh, some influential guests from outside of the G7, including the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Now, at the end of the second day of the summit, we got the joint statement from the G7 leaders as we saw leaders, including the U.S. President Joe Biden, departing for home. Uh, in that statement, we saw the G7 uh, criticizing China for what they described as comprehensive non-market policies that they say lead to market distortions and harmful overcapacity. Uh, Beijing has previously said that the G7 is exaggerating these claims around what it describes as industrial overcapacity. Uh, we also saw a new coalition being launched by the G7 to crack down on illegal smuggling groups uh, that take migrants across different bodies of water around the world. And the group has also reiterated its stance that it supports the US-led proposal for a ceasefire in Gaza. Giles Gibson for CGTN, Bari in southern Italy.
Cross-border strikes are continuing in southern Lebanon with skirmishes between the Israeli military and Hezbollah fighters. Israel has confirmed it launched a drone attack on a suspected Hezbollah militant who was traveling on a motorbike near the border. Meanwhile, Hezbollah has reportedly fired two missiles at a military airbase in northern Israel. Let's go live to Tel Aviv and join now by CGTN's Jonathan Regev. Hello, Jonathan. So what exactly is Israel saying about the situation at the Lebanese border, which, of course, uh, impacts northern Israel? Yes, uh, the situation has been uh, deteriorating uh, by the day, especially over the past week. The past week was, I think, by far the most violent on uh, the Israel-Lebanon border. On the one hand, Israel uh, carrying various uh, targeted strikes on uh, Hezbollah uh, operatives north of the border. Uh, there was one uh, this morning, as you mentioned, and earlier in the week, a senior Hezbollah official was uh, targeted and, and killed. On the other hand, Hezbollah responding by, by uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of rockets and the UAVs fired from Lebanon into Israel. Today has been perhaps a little bit more quiet uh, compared with the previous days in, in, in this respect, but still there are plenty of uh, sirens in the uh, northern border. How long can Israel take it? That's a very good uh, question. Uh, we, we know from uh, residents in the northern border, they've been away from their homes for more than eight months now, and they're saying if, if anyone ever thinks about us coming back home, first we have to feel safe. We cannot feel safe uh, knowing that Hezbollah is still around. Hezbollah is still able to fire anti-tank missiles uh, from uh, quite short ranges to the Israeli communities which lie right on uh, the border fence. Uh, I think the Israeli uh, leadership is uh, well aware that in order to provide uh, complete safety to the residents, a ground operation, a massive operation would be needed. At least for now, Israel is still focusing on the Gaza front, not uh, carrying that major attack uh, in, on the northern border. But if Israel really wants to provide uh, safety and security for all those residents, tens of thousands of uh, the northern communities if they want to, if israel wants to see all of them coming home then eventually a much bigger military operation will be needed all right thank you so much for that update jonathan regev in tel aviv in gaza city at least 28 people are reported to have been killed in the most recent israeli bombing akram al satari is in central gaza 30 people were killed in the last 24 hours 28 people were killed in the last 12 hours Eight people were received by the Gaza European Hospital in the last three hours, which is indicative of the intensified bombardment that have been taking place in different areas of Rafah. Also, some parts of Gaza South and Gaza City were witnessing intensified bombardment, where around 19 people were killed in a bombardment that targeted three different houses in a neighborhood in ash -Shajaya. So the pace of the military operation is intensified. The, also, the Apaches are engaging in that gun and exchange a gunfire and exchange of fire. I could see the Apaches shooting at the western part of Rafah. I could see them shooting at those areas since the morning, which is indicative of the fact that the ground operations are facing significant challenges controlling the ground and that they are facing fierce resistance from the ground. Uh, Hamas has been releasing, the military wing of Hamas has been releasing different statements about their fighters targeting uh, uh, vehicles, uh, armored vehicles of the army and causing some massive killing and injury among those troops. In the, mean, in the meantime, around 90 Palestinians injured in the last 24 hours and around 40, uh, uh, 24, 28 killed because of that ongoing bombardment. So the situation is still likely to escalate and the exchange of fire is getting heavier by the, mon by the minute in Rafah and other parts of the Gaza Strip. And the humanitarian situation, of course, continues to be extremely dire. And I would imagine it's another blow with the news that this U.S.-built um, aid pier is now to be temporarily dismantled. It seems to have been beset with problems. What's going on? Well, the weather is stable in Gaza. It's summer. The sea is very calm. No high waves. So, therefore, there would be no technical 
uh, issues whatsoever facing that peer. The problem with that peer seems to be a political problem. Palestinians from the very beginning were, very, were extremely skeptical about the intention and the hidden agenda behind that peer. Then came the incident of an Nusayrat where 247 Palestinians were killed because of the Israeli sudden operation that targeted uh, the, uh, the refugee camp and ended up in the release of four Israeli captives. And now the American administration is announcing the dismantling of that peer and the Palestinians, or most of them, are linking the dismantling of that peer with the mission that has been already accomplished, which is the release of the Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli captives. Most of the Palestinians think that way, and most of them have been very skeptical about the intentions of the United States of America from every single move that is being done, and they have been believing that the USA that has been supporting the ongoing warfare and providing Israel with the arm is not going to provide them with a humanitarian aid or a lifeline free of a charge or with no hidden agenda. Akram al satari in Gaza. The leaders of around 100 countries and organizations are meeting in Switzerland for a summit aimed at ending the conflict in Ukraine. However, Russia was not invited to the event at Lake Lucerne. China is also not attending as Beijing said it required, quote, equal participation of all parties. The summit aims to lay the groundwork for a peace plan. Food and nuclear security are expected to be key issues. The gathering is the biggest meeting on Ukraine since the conflict began more than two years ago. Cyril Ramaphosa has been re-elected as president of South Africa after an historic coalition deal was agreed. The new government will include the African National Congress and its largest rival, the Democratic Alliance, in a major political shift for the country. The ANC has been in power for 30 years, but lost its majority in last month's elections. Our correspondent Rene Del Calm reports. It's been another defining moment in South Africa's political history. The first sitting of the seventh parliament in South Africa's 30 years of democracy. Nearly 400 members of parliament were sworn in and a new speaker and deputy speaker of parliament were elected. The ANC and its opposition, the Democratic Alliance, which have long been political rivals, some would say enemies, agreed in an historic agreement to set aside their differences, they say, for the sake of South Africa and all its people. And in the interest of building the country, taking it forward to a more stable economic and political future. Rene Del Palm reporting there. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. Why Norway isn't wholeheartedly celebrating its burgeoning surfing industry. A reminder of our headlines. Getting relations back on track, Chinese Premier Li Chung kicks off his first visit to Australia. G7 leaders back calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as they wrap up their summit in Italy. Cyril Ramaphosa is re-elected as South Africa's president after an historic deal to form a unity government. 
Dengue fever is on the rise around the world, but the once tropical disease is now appearing more frequently in Europe. The mosquito that carries it has spread northwards due to the hotter, wetter weather caused by climate change. The insects are now present in 13 European countries, including France, Germany and Greece. Evangelo Sipsas reports from Athens. Temperatures are rising in southern Europe, creating favorable conditions for tourism and holidays, but also for mosquitoes. Reports of dengue fever are increasing in the region with experts linking the local outbreak to an invasive mosquito species. WHO has assessed the risk of dengue as high globally, which with what it means is that it requires the maximal attention and response from all levels of the organization to support countries around the world controlling the current dengue outbreaks and also preparing for the countries to respond to the upcoming dengue season. Typically found in the tropical and subtropical regions of Southeast Asia and Africa, the species commonly known as the tiger mosquito is believed to be behind the rise of dengue fever in Europe. Scientists attribute its increased presence in Europe to climate change. Usually, Europe reports imported cases from the, from the Americas, from the Western Pacific, from the endemic regions. But this, re this year, we saw limited clusters of autochthonous transmission. Uh, as we know, the, the summers are getting warmer, and the, there are two main vectors of this, of this virus. One is Aedes albopictus, which is widely distributed in, in Europe. According to the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, fewer than 80 cases of dengue fever were reported from 2010 to 2021. However, more than 130 cases were reported last year alone, and scientists fear that the number could increase further this year. Dengue could be difficult to detect, with the most common symptoms being a fever that typically appears 3 to 14 days after exposure. This outbreak is causing significant concerns for Italy, Spain and Greece during the tourism season. The European Centre for Disease Control and Prevention says that the outbreak in Europe is limited and does not pose a threat to travellers. However, visitors should take precautions and avoid exposures to a disease that doesn't seem to be going away. Evangelo Sipsos for CGTN, Athens. Football now and Spain and Croatia are going head to head in their first game of Euro 2024. Our correspondent Peter Oliver is in Berlin with a match kicked off a short while ago. Hello Peter, big game for Spain and Croatia today. Hello. What's the atmosphere like? It's absolutely fantastic, as you would imagine, with these two teams. They both bring large followings wherever they go. They bring colourful followings and very loud followings as well. Uh, it's currently nil-nil in the match right now. Uh, when it comes to the two sides, Croatia have been the bridesmaid, but never the bride in recent World Cups. However, I was shocked to find out that despite those second and third place finishes in uh, the World Championships, in the Euros, they've not got beyond the, uh, the quarterfinals since way back in 2008. The only other time they've done that was in uh, 1996. Spain are three times champions. Last time out in this tournament, they came third. As I said, though, absolutely packed here uh, with fans. We're looking at around 75,000 in the Olympic Stadium. I'm here in the fan park in central Berlin in front of the, the Brandenburg Gate where tens of thousands more have gathered. I spoke to some of them earlier on as they were soaking up the atmosphere. <laughs> Italy as well. I just want that Croatia wins and the atmosphere is great. There are lots of Croatians from everywhere. Espanol, Luka Modric, es Espanol. Uh, Spain versus Croatia. We hope uh, to see, uh, to watch a lot of goals and I hope that Spain wins. So we will see. Being had here in central Berlin. Currently nil-nil scoreless in the main event though in the stadium at the Olympic Stadium here in the German capital. And of course, last night hosts Germany, a wonderful start for them. Not so much for Scotland, but do German fans think that that team will go all the way? 
Oh, tunes have changed here in Germany, I can tell you, after that Scotland drubbing 5-1 against the Scots. It was a, a valiant performance by the Scottish fans, not so much by their players on the pitch. What I can tell you is that a tournament that has been greeted a little bit with a shrug here in Germany has now developed into full-blown Euro fever. In a baker's shop in Braunschweig, we've been sent pictures of the, the 5-1 cake, which is doing the round. It was pointed out to me they didn't make any cake when they lost 2-0 uh, to South Korea not so long ago. But yes, uh, German fans convinced now that they can go all the way. It is a difficult group. I have to say, I think last night's win, if I was to give my own personal opinion on it, was a little bit down to a poor Scotland side as much as it was down to any top performance from Germany. I will make you a promise here and now, though, to you in London and to all of the CGTN viewers, if Germany make it to the final here in Berlin on July the 14th, I will do what I'm doing right now in a Germany shirt. You can hold me to that. I'm fairly <laughs> confident. I probably won't be doing that. <laughs> well, let's hope uh, you get to eat cake and not humble pie. Thank you very much, Peter Oliver, uh, in Berlin for us as that Spain-Croatia match continues. Now, China has successfully completed testing a rocket engine developed for its first manned lunar mission. This is the largest engine system to be trialed yet by engineers. The test was also the most complicated so far in the development of the lunar mission rockets. China hopes to put astronauts on the moon before 2030. Britain's Princess of Wales has made her first public appearance since announcing a cancer diagnosis three months ago. Kate attended an annual military parade in London on Saturday, marking the official birthday of the British monarch, King Charles. The princess has been receiving chemotherapy. In a statement, she said she was making good progress, but was not out of the woods yet. Muslim pilgrims from around the world have gathered at Mount Arafat in Saudi Arabia for the most important day of the Hajj pilgrimage. Worshippers began the climb at sunrise to reach the place where it is believed Prophet Muhammad delivered his final speech over a thousand years ago. Saudi authorities expect more than two million pilgrims this year. Now, surf's up in the Arctic, but it's a serious business. While water sports enthusiasts are making the most of the longest summers in northern Norway, the reason for the changing weather pattern is nothing to cheer. Our correspondent, Johannes Plechberger, reports from the Lofoten Islands. Get feet together, paddle, guys, paddle, paddle, up! Surfing north of the Arctic Circle used to be a dare. Now the world's northernmost surf school on Norway's Unster Beach is swamped with tourists. Blue water, white sand beach, and uh, yeah, we didn't expect it to be so gorgeous. Uh, it's it's beaten all of our expectations. <laughs> The Arctic has been hit hardest by climate change. Temperatures are rising three times faster than the global average. Here in northern Norway, winters are getting one day shorter each year, making it possible to enjoy more time on the surfboard. A thick six millimeter wetsuit is needed, however, to feel comfortable at water temperatures around eight degrees Celsius. One of the archipelago's three surf schools, the Lofoten Surf Center, was able to double its turnover in the last six years. So we've had a surf school here for, uh, for 10 years now, and uh, kind of slow when we started, and, uh, but the last six years it's just going up, 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 up. Weather conditions on the Lofoten Islands have been unusually sunny and warm these past weeks, surprising tourists and locals alike. It's just May and it's so warm. Yeah. It's like a mm. August day. Yeah. 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 Last year uh, on this date I think we had snow. For now, tourism in northern Norway seems to be profiting from climate change. But global warming also increases the risk of floods, landslides and rising sea levels, which can disrupt tourism and drastically change biodiversity in this beautiful part of the Arctic. Johannes Blechberger, CGTN. Lofoten, Norway. The Olympic Games get underway towards the end of next month. Three-time Ghanaian Paralympian Raphael Botsjon-Kegbe has his target firmly set on Paris. 
fresh from a grueling preparation race in the United States. He spoke to our correspondent, Nabil Ahmed Rufai. Ghanaian para-athletes Rafael Boutre Nkebe is stepping up preparations for the Paris 2024 Paralympics qualifiers. He is in the U.S. to participate in international wheelchair race competitions and hopes to make the time for the Paralympic Games qualification. This event I participated in before the 2019, that gave me the current record I'm holding with a time of 14.22 seconds. So uh, I'm looking forward for that, and uh, that will be one of the biggest events for me. Inkegbe has taken part in three Paralympics, the first in 2004 in Athens, Beijing 2008, and then in London 2012. He didn't win any medals, but with the experience gained, he hopes to make it to the podium in Paris. My aim is to go beyond what I've done in the previous years to be able to represent the nation and winning Ghana first Paralympics medal. The qualification for the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games expires in July, but no Ghanaian para-athlete has qualified yet. Ghana's Paralympic Committee says it will assist at least five para-athletes to take part in qualification events in Japan, Switzerland and France. Rafael Butcher Nkegbe believes with the needed support, he and other para-athletes can qualify for the Paralympics and together proudly represent Ghana in Paris. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. Now in a moment, my colleague Juliet Mann will be here with the agenda. In this week's show, the rise of the right, what do the results of last week's EU elections really mean for the future of Europe? That's the agenda right after the world today at half past four GMT here on CGTN. The headlines once more, getting relations back on track. Chinese Premier Li Chung kicks off his first visit to Australia. G7 leaders back calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as they wrap up their summit in Italy. Sir Ramaphosa is re-elected as South Africa's president after an historic deal to form a unity government. And that's the world today. Thank you so much for watching. There's more news on CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. More news at the top of the hour. For now, from all of us here in London, goodbye.